A posse of Colombians is cruising the streets of Miami. They're part of a notorious gang known as the Cocaine Cowboys. Their destination, the Dadeland shopping mall. Their target, a liquor store. Their mission, to take out a rival cocaine dealing gang. When the cops arrive, they're shocked by the brazen daytime execution. Two known cocaine dealers dead, and two innocent store clerks critically wounded. The disregard for human life there at the scene was something that we had never seen or heard of here in South Florida. For Nelson Andrew, a young detective with the Miami police, it's a baptism of fire. I was in as a homicide detective within 10 months of graduating the police academy. I mean, I was a rookie policeman shaken in my boots. The cops find a specially modified van which they believe belongs to the assassins. The vehicle that they had abandoned, the war wagon that was covered with bulletproof vests to make it almost like an armored vehicle. Inside, there's an arsenal of deadly high-tech weapons. Police officers were still using six-shot revolvers, and these guys had Uzi submachine guns. So the police department itself were not prepared for that. The victims are Colombian drug dealers, so police search for information in Miami's Colombian immigrant community. Why did this happen? We didn't know at the time. We didn't even know who the shooters were. But no one has the courage to speak out. Very, very difficult to get any type of information from these Colombians. They were very tight-lipped. Because the massacre is part of something much bigger. It was a Wild West show down here, and that was really sort of exhibit A, the Dadeland murders. Gangland warfare has been raging across the city for three years. Miami saw dramatic changes in the homicide rate. Um, we went from probably 80 to 100 murders a year to almost three to 400. We would just find the bodies shot in cars or restaurants or wherever it was. It's the worst violence in any US city since the bloody era of Al Capone. A hundred thousand criminals, 350 rival gangs, slaughtering each other for a piece of the action. The victims all meet an especially violent death. Overkill. You can shoot a person one time in the head and they're gonna die, but they would shoot you 10 times. And all are involved in Miami's booming new trade. Cocaine was being imported by the ton, by boat, by plane, in cargo. No longer a high-priced celebrity party drug, cocaine is fueling a new epidemic of organized crime. It's on the streets, easily available and destroying millions of American lives. In Miami, cops are determined to find out which Colombian kingpin is behind the violence. They pull in street corner dealers, grilling them for information about their suppliers. Threatened with jail time, the dealers start to talk, and they all whisper, the same name. That's when Griselda Blanco emerged. The crime boss orchestrating this rampant drug war is a woman. A Colombian native named Griselda Blanco. She was the largest cocaine importer of the, at the time. Known in cities across the US as the Godmother. 
for her mafia-like brutality. One of the most feared narcotics homicidal maniacs that we've ever encountered. I should say late 70s in Miami that she really begins to emerge as this female Al Capone. If she owed you money and didn't want to pay you, she'd kill you. If you owed her money, she'd kill you. Sometimes she would just kill you for the fun of it. To trace Blanco's transformation into the violent, bloodthirsty woman who will earn the name the Black Widow, you have to go back over 25 years. Griselda Blanco is a slum kid, growing up in Medellin, Colombia's second largest city. Her community of Barrio Antioquia is a ghetto of gangsters, prostitutes, and killers. She lived in a neighborhood that was so uniquely criminal that it had been designated a tolerance zone, which is to say a red light district, by the city. Things that were illegal elsewhere were legal in that little neighborhood. Griselda begins her life of crime as a pickpocket. But then she steps it up. Legend has it, at the tender age of 11, she kidnaps a boy her own age from an upscale neighborhood. She holds him for ransom. His parents don't take her threats seriously. Without a second thought, she takes his life. A cold-blooded killer even before she hits her teens it's a mark of what she's prepared to do to get what she wants. This was another level of killing that cannot be explained by anything I think in her background. I think it's something in her soul. She was a born criminal. At 13, Griselda gets a boyfriend. The much older, Carlos Trujillo. He's a Colombian people trafficker. Over five years, he teaches Griselda the dark art of passport forgery. And she becomes expert in creating fake identities. Together, they organize the illegal smuggling of thousands of people into the United States. I believe he was her one true love. He taught her a lot. He certainly taught her how to smuggle. By the time she's 19, Griselda and Carlos Trujillo are married with three sons. They divide their time between Colombia and New York. But when in 1970, Trujillo dies suddenly and suspiciously of liver failure, Griselda takes center stage. At 27, Griselda should be a grieving widow, but Trujillo has served his purpose, and she has already lined up his replacement, another gangster named Alberto Bravo. She forges relationships with men early on that are beneficial to her economically and then socially. Bravo doesn't smuggle people, but cocaine. Blanco sees there's serious money to be made. And that money is in the United States. But Bravo's drug business is small time. A few smugglers trafficking trivial amounts of cocaine. Blanco has much bigger ambitions for overhauling the drug trade and building a cocaine empire in America.
Bravo and Blanco are this perfect partnership. And they're in the right place at the right time with the right product. Criminal mastermind Griselda Blanco and her drug dealing lover are poised to take the United States by storm and spark an unprecedented crime wave that will sweep from coast to coast. Colombian drug traffickers Griselda Blanco and Alberto Bravo move their headquarters from Medellin, Colombia to the Big Apple and hit the big time. Their aim, to make billions by controlling cocaine smuggling into American cities. Griselda Blanco has a vision to build herself a criminal empire. With her network of illegal Colombian dealers already operating within the United States, she has a ready-made distribution network in place. Now all she has to do is come up with a way to import the cocaine in mass quantities. First step, Griselda Blanco's lover and business partner, Bravo, buys cocaine in Bolivia and Peru and transports it across the unguarded borders to Colombia. There, it gets repackaged in Blanco's hometown of Medellin. As a woman in a man's world, her masterstroke is to devise a new way of smuggling the cocaine into the US. Stashed where no one would think to look. They were creating garments. These garments would allow for the drugs to be more smooth around the body. It would just look like a woman's natural figure. She selects only Colombian women as her mules and trains them to flaunt their sexuality to distract the border guards. She encouraged the women to dress very attractively, to be um, flirtatious with customs agents and immigration agents. The drug mules carry the cocaine aboard flights to the US. Each woman holds a kilo of cocaine, $10,000 in net profit. To the average customs officer, Blanco's drug mules are just especially voluptuous women. No one's going to suspect that a young woman who's very nicely dressed is going to be wearing a bra padded with cocaine. The mules touch down in New York, where Griselda's underground network of Colombian distributors lie waiting. Within hours, the cocaine hits the streets. The new tidal wave of cocaine gets the attention of New York's police department and the Drug Enforcement Administration. They set up an undercover operation to hunt down the source. Operation Banshee. One of their finest agents is Robert Nieves, a Puerto Rican American born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, and recruited by the DEA. His partner is Bob Palumbo, a Spanish-speaking narcotics expert, investigating the Colombian drug trade for three years. Two years into the operation, Nieves and Palumbo get a break. They arrest a small-time dealer. Threatened with 30 years in prison, he sees no option but to talk. Informants were working off a nut. What we mean by that when we say working off a nut is he's facing serious prison time and he doesn't want to go to jail. And so he agrees to cooperate with the government. The motivating factor, more often than not, is the ability to shave some time off of their jail sentence. The dealer says his supplier is a woman, Lila Parada. Lilia Parada worked within the organization. She was a distributor. She's identified fairly early on as being involved by the NYPD. Nieves and Palombo quickly realize Parada is not a big fish. 
but she could still reveal vital information on the true Mastermind's distribution network. So they wire her apartment. We were listening to conversations real time on targeted telephones. In those days, we didn't have sophisticated software. That didn't exist. The software was a pen and paper, and there were log books. Making sense of what they hear is not as simple as it seems. The detectives listening to the wiretaps involved in the case had to speak fluent Spanish. But the Spanish is all in code. Spanish is Spanish, but the Colombians, especially Colombian traffickers, have their own in Spanish argot. It's slang. They had certain codes. Somebody has left the funeral. This might mean that cocaine was en route to New York. Beautiful children with good bones meant high 100% cocaine with crystal. So not only are they speaking in guarded terms and camouflaging their conversation by talking about the children, talking about this or that, but they're also speaking in a jargon that's unique to the neighborhood they grew up in Medellin. And so it became very difficult uh, at times to really get the gist of the conversation. Worse still, all the names are fake. The Colombians then as now always operated with aliases. Nobody would ever use their real name. They had very good false ID from driver's licenses to passports multiple names associated with those documents. You never knew who you had in custody. But in the transcripts, two code names appear more than others. The DEA identifies them as Carmen and Gloria Caban, their sisters already serving time for cocaine trafficking. As veteran drug mules, they must know key players in the Colombian cocaine network. There were two girls that were locked up on state charges who were closely associated with the hierarchy of these people from Medellin. Agent Nieves pays a visit to the older sister. Carmen Caban. But even from a secure prison cell, Caban refuses to talk. If I could compare their fear, uh, it would be the kind of fear that the first informant who talked about Al Capone felt. So Nieves makes her an offer. Where is it? Placement in witness protection and the chance of seeing her family again. I don't know how many years the Caban sisters were facing, but the likelihood of her seeing family members was not likely at all. It's an offer she can't refuse. Caban reveals the names of 37 Colombians dealing drugs in New York alone. Then she finally delivers the name of the ruthless criminal mastermind behind it all. Griselda Blanca. It was surprising at that time uh, to hear of a woman who was running a criminal organization, engaged on a violent end of the business, the person who resolved everything with a gun. It's the breakthrough Nieves and Palombo have worked for two years to achieve. Now they have enough evidence to indict Blanco and her henchmen with mass-scale drug trafficking. There's only one problem. They have no idea what this matriarchal manipulator looks like. We couldn't find a photograph of Griselda Blanco, so she was just a name. Blanco is untraceable because she makes use of every trick her dead first husband, the forger Trujillo, taught her. She comes and goes using a different fake identity every time. How are you going to arrest somebody 
who is moving in and out of the country, moving under false documents, has multiple aliases and identities, and you don't even have an image of that person. When she gets word that the DEA are closing in on her criminal gang, she goes underground and completely disappears. She would be in the wind. She might be back in Colombia. I don't think there was any hope that they would ever be able to find her again. In Colombia, she's out of reach and nearly impossible to trace. It's a major defeat for the DEA. But what Nieves and Palombo don't know is they're not the only ones gunning for Griselda Blanco. The head of a ruthless new gang begins to muscle in on Griselda Blanco's territory. His name, Pablo Escobar. And he poses a much greater threat than any of her previous rivals. He wasn't afraid of her. Everyone else was, but he wasn't. Escobar will become known as the king of cocaine, the wealthiest criminal in history, responsible for transforming Bogota, Colombia, into the world's murder capital. But first, he has to confront the fearsome Griselda Blanco. Already by about 1975, she and Pablo were fighting, literally trying to kill one another. Each had his or her team of assassins after the other. Blanco realizes if she is to defend her vast cocaine empire against serious competition, she needs to ramp up her violent tactics in the ultimate show of force. On the streets of Medellin, Blanco develops what becomes her signature method of assassination. The motorcycle drive-by. Her brazen methods keep Escobar at bay, while she delights in her power to kill. For six years, Blanco and Alberto Bravo have made an invincible team. But their relationship eventually starts to sour. Blanco believes rumors Bravo has been skimming profits and having an affair. Killing Bravo earns her a new nickname. She was like the Black Widow. She made it and then she killed her mate. The nickname the Black Widow fit her very well. Word hits the streets the Black Widow will stop at nothing in her quest for criminal supremacy. But one foe still stands in her way. Colombian rival Pablo Escobar now has more than just a foothold in Blanco's territory. Undaunted by the Black Widow's reputation, Escobar kills police and bribes officials to secure Medellin Airport as his own. It strangles her main distribution route to the United States. 
Pablo Escobar made it impossible for her to be in Medellin. On the run from the DEA in New York and muscled out of her Colombian hometown by rival Pablo Escobar, Griselda Blanco, the mistress of disguise, once again vanishes into thin air. Three years into Operation Banshee, and the DEA's search for the Black Widow in New York has gone stone cold. They wonder if she's got out of the cocaine business, or maybe even been killed. But then in 1976, events a thousand miles away in Florida give agents a brand new set of leads. Organized crime sweeps through Florida's haven of sun and sand, Miami. The DEA begins to think the Black Widow may no longer be on the run, but back on US soil. What's more, informants reveal her aliases to customs officials. At last, the DEA can put a face to the name Black Widow. In 1979, at the Dadeland Mall, the Cocaine Cowboys gang brutally assassinate their rivals in broad daylight. The over-the-top violence bears the hallmarks of a Black Widow hit. Now the Florida police believe she has set up her headquarters in Miami and is single-handedly triggering bloody gang warfare that sort of came to symbolize the lawlessness of what was going on in Miami. It really embodied the deterioration of law and order and the overwhelming impact that drug dealing was having on the city. The Miami police are soon swamped. There weren't the cops, there weren't the agents, uh, they didn't have the information, they didn't have the resources. I mean, there were no facilities available to stem this and the distribution was extremely violent. Soon after, something happens to confirm law enforcement's suspicions that Blanco is behind it all. A young detective with the Miami police is called to the scene of a shooting at the home of a Colombian family, the Lorenzos. His name? Nelson Andrew. You could tell that there had been a struggle in the house because of the blood that's in the carpeting. You can tell that people were, had been shot and were running. Andrew has been working homicide for around a year. Bringing the perpetrators to justice becomes his mission, no matter the personal cost. Missed birthdays, missed Christmas, Thanksgiving, anniversaries. You get called out at 3 o'clock in the morning in the middle of the night, and this happens over and over and over again. And you're only dealing with bad people, bad situations, death of sometimes of children. It was just too much, too quick. Something that we weren't ready for as a police department, we weren't ready for as a city, but it was here. But this is no routine homicide. The Lorenzos are cocaine dealers. And their killers came looking for revenge. They're tied up. They have belts. They have telephone cords that are used to tie them up. They were both shot multiple, multiple times, I think three or four times each in the, in the torso and in the head. The evidence of torture, the violent overkill, the links to cocaine. It leaves the DEA in no doubt. The Black Widow is back and more deadly than ever. You know, that's the way she operated. She resolved all, all problems with a hit.
During her Florida reign of terror, the Black Widow orders as many as 200 revenge attacks. Every month, her empire ships more than 3,400 pounds of cocaine into the country. Her distribution network spans the entire US and makes her $80 million monthly. The Miami cops and the DEA know the Black Widow is behind the slaughter on the streets, but they have no idea from where she's running the show. We knew that she was alive and we knew that she was in operation, but you know, how she was running the operation, where the principal players were, uh, that we did not know to bring her to justice, first they have to lure her from her hiding place, then set a trap to gather airtight evidence against her. What they learn from informants on the streets sparks an entirely new strategy. She had installed each of her three older sons, Uber, Osvaldo, and Dixon in each of the three major areas of her distribution, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Miami. The Black Widow now has so many enemies, the only people she can really trust are her own flesh and blood. On one level, drug businesses are family businesses, because who else can you really trust? Now the DEA team thinks they can turn the Black Widow's strength into her weakness. If they can somehow gain the trust of one of her sons, then they may just be able to get the insider information they so desperately need to bring her whole drug smuggling operation crashing down. DEA agent Bob Palumbo has spent 10 years on Blanco's trail from New York to Miami. Now he needs to position an informant at the heart of Blanco's family network. We really had to have somebody inside the organization, which was very, very difficult because this was an extremely close-knit group. These people don't deal with strangers. She's only going to deal with people that she knows. Finally, in April 1983, Palumbo gets the opportunity he's been waiting for. Serving time for narcotics trafficking, the DEA finds a Colombian who might just give them access to Blanco's inner family circle. His name is Jerry Gomez. He is a businessman who knows Blanco's three sons with first husband, Carlos Trujillo. Gomez had run a motorcycle shop in Medellin, Colombia, and had sold Blanco's sons some motorcycles. We felt he could make a credible approach to them. The plan is to release him from his 10-year stretch and send him undercover. Gomez is to approach one of Blanco's sons, offering to launder money for them across their national network. If Jerry could weave his way into the confidence of even just one of the sons, we would eventually uh, find the mother and we would find the other two brothers. It's a huge gamble and they won't know if they can trust him 
until it's too late. We were in custody of a sentenced federal prisoner. If Jerry had fled, it would have been a huge embarrassment uh, to us and it would have been no end of trouble. But the DEA feels it's their only choice. Gomez sets up a meeting in California with Griselda Blanco's youngest son, 24-year-old Dixon Trujillo. Initially, Jerry was able to interest him in the proposition. Dixon was ready to take the bait. Wearing a wire, Gomez keeps his cool. And Dixon Blanco doesn't appear to know he's being set up. He even gives away that his mother is always on the move between Miami and LA. But he is no more specific than that. At the end of the meeting, the team can't tell if they've done enough to trick Dixon into drawing his mother from her lair. Three tense weeks later, Gomez gets a call. But it's not from Dixon Blanco. It's from the Black Widow herself. And she's taken the bait. Which was, of course, a huge breakthrough in the investigation because it not only provided hopeful conversation in which she would incriminate herself, but it also gave us the first lead I think we had as to her actual whereabouts. Griselda Blanco wants to meet Gomez but she says she no longer operates out of Miami. She'd made things so dangerous for herself and her family that she too took up in, in California. Blanco invites Gomez to meet her in a Los Angeles hotel. To get Blanco to incriminate herself on tape, the DEA has to resist the temptation to arrest her on site. Wired for the meeting, Gomez feels the pressure. There was concern that Jerry could slip up or Jerry could offend Griselda at, at any moment, or Jerry could be unmasked at any moment. And Jerry was terrified. But it's simply too late to pull out. As he sits alone with her, Gomez starts to fall apart. Jerry became totally incoherent. I mean, the conversation was muddled. He was so fearful, he could not string together two logical sentences. This isn't the type of man the Black Widow trusts. I think she smelled something pretty quickly. She was not going to trust him with money. She was not going to trust him with drugs. I mean, he simply was not going to be made part of her operation. Jerry's performance is a disaster for the DEA. We weren't going to get any more. We had what we had, and it was not a slam dunk. It was not a, you know, open and shut prosecution. But it was viable, and we went with it. Now the DEA has no choice but to sift through all of Gomez's recorded conversations for hard evidence they can use in a prosecution. Names of the key players, the location of the drugs, clues to the hiding place of the Black Widow herself. And it turns out their terrified informant has extracted a vital piece of information. The address of a Los Angeles distributor. Palombo obtains a warrant to search the property. 
In the course of reviewing the information gathered from the execution of one of the search warrants, they found a utility bill for uh, an apartment in Irvine. Palombo's instincts tell him this Irvine apartment is exactly the type of residence Blanco would use to lay low. It was an upscale but not elaborate apartment. But he has to act quickly before she pulls another disappearing act. After a decade-long manhunt, he cannot afford to let the Black Widow slip from his grasp again. Palombo decides to stake out the address they've traced in Irvine, California. He needs to confirm it is the Black Widow's hideout. As soon as she's spotted inside the property, Palombo calls for backup. The fear was that if they could not affect the arrest then and there, they might never see her again. Chips roll in on this. No bodyguards, no booby traps. Her only protection, a weapon on the dresser. Just out of reach. Bob went directly up to Griselda and gave her a big kiss on the cheek. She demanded to know, what is that for? which Bob replied, that's because I'm so glad to see you. Because Bob had been hunting her for a decade. Within months, all three of Blanco's sons are captured in sting operations by the DEA. It's the culmination of over 10 years of dedication, bringing the most deadly female cocaine boss in history and her criminal family to justice. I think it was just real relief. Uh, I mean, it was a masterful operation, and to have rolled up Griselda and her three sons all at the same time was really an accomplishment. Charged in New York with drug trafficking offenses, Blanco serves 13 of a 15-year sentence in a federal jail. In 1994, She's put on trial in Florida for murder. But when a sex scandal between witness and prosecution becomes public, the prosecution is forced to cut a deal with Blanco. Blanco avoids death row. And with time already served, the murder rap adds just seven years. In 2004, she is released and deported to her native Colombia. Then she pulls her best disappearing act yet and stays hidden for more than five years. But that's not the end of the story.
At the age of 69, Griselda Blanco is dead. Gunned down by her own ruthless method. For the agents who spent a decade chasing her, it comes as no surprise. We were waiting for that news that Griselda was killed. The fact that she lasted so many years, that's exceptional. Griselda Blanco really was the perfect sociopath. A plane from Colombia's Tampa Airlines touches down at Miami International Airport. According to the cargo manifest, it's carrying boxes of jeans. But DEA agents in Colombia have been tipped off that hidden in the clothing is a huge shipment of cocaine. That informant was telling us that it would be at least 500 kilograms of cocaine. Up to this point in time, we had never seen that amount of cocaine. There had been no seizures in my, either Miami or New York, anywhere near that. When customs agents search the boxes, they are stunned. Not only did they find 500 kilograms, they found 1,700 kilograms of cocaine. The nearly two tons of cocaine is valued at an incredible $175 million. At the time, it's the biggest seizure made worldwide. For the first time, I think uh, that was an eye-opener for us. We in the DEA and other government officials understood what we were dealing with. Drugs are menacing our society. They're threatening our values and undercutting our institutions. And we the huge Tampa Hall sends shockwaves through U.S. law parents. enforcement. President Reagan sets up a Southern Florida drug task force. And from all over the USA, hundreds more federal agents are drafted in. For Florida DEA agents on the front line of the drug war, like Mike McManus, is not a moment too soon. Three years earlier, he had been an undercover Fort Lauderdale cop. Then one night, a drug sting went badly wrong. I had two bad guys pull guns on me, and I was able to disarm them. My partner was pistol whipped and ultimately went to the hospital. The shootout changes the course of McManus's life. But I told my wife, I now know what I want to do for the rest of my life. I'm going to go with the DEA. This is going to turn out to be my life's passion. Agent McManus knows that the Tampa shipment would have caused all-out street war between the cocaine dealers. And only one man has the know-how to set up a deal this big. Someone who has been a thorn in their sides for the last four years, Carlos Leder. The son of a German father and Colombian mother. He had been brought up in the city of Armenia, 260 kilometers west of the Colombian capital, Bogota. Childhood friend Carlos Toro remembers that even then, Leda was trouble. But every family have uh, uh, black ships, and he was one in his family, I was one in mine. A secret police report in World War II claimed Leda's father was a Nazi sympathizer. But it is Leda himself who will soon reveal a worship of Adolf Hitler. For now, Leda's plan is to get out of Armenia and make it big in America. He moves there when he is just 17. One day, uh, which I remember very vividly, I was walking down the street of Armenia, uh, one early evening, and, and I saw him coming towards me, and we, we hugged, and, and he's very happy, and, and he says, look what I got, and he pulled his passport, and he said, I went to Cali, and I get an American visa. I'm going to the United States. Toro is determined to join his friend, but his own father gives him a warning. And my dad, uh, at the time, he said, if you go, 
you will go, but not with Carlos. He's trouble. He's, he's that, you know, the best influence. At first, Leda seems happy with the American way of life. They had spent a number of years uh, in, in, in the U.S. and being educated here. In fact, he had a brother uh, that was a, uh, in the United States Army and, and fought in Vietnam. Unlike his brother, Carlos Leda has no desire to serve America. His adopted nation is just a place to get rich quick. He was part of an auto theft ring. They were stealing automobiles and shipping them back to Colombia to make money. So this is his first venture into American crime. Then later moves from cars to drugs. But in 1974, he is busted in Miami for possession of 200 pounds of marijuana. The 25-year-old Leda is sentenced to four years in Danbury Correctional Institution, Connecticut. At Danbury, he pairs up with an American inmate. It changes the course of his life. He met a fellow prisoner named George Young, uh, who had done some uh, marijuana smuggling. And uh, he and Young uh, talked about uh, smuggling drugs. Aside from their dope smuggling, the power-hungry Leda seems to have little in common with the 28-year-old Young. But George was an old-time hippie. George was very personable. He's the type of guy that you'd want to go out and have a beer with. Young made hundreds of thousands of dollars flying planes loaded with marijuana from Mexico to landing sites in the Californian desert. Leda absorbs every detail of Young's airborne smuggling operation. But marijuana won't satisfy his greed for profit or lust for power. He has another drug in mind, one that is easy to get hold of in his native Colombia, cocaine. Carlos later had the very bright idea, um, you could say it was a brilliant idea, rather than smuggle marijuana, why not smuggle cocaine and make a whole lot more money? For years, cocaine production had been centered in Chile, Bolivia, and Peru. But by the mid-1970s, Colombian traffickers had taken over. Under their control, cocaine really took off. The Colombians would buy the paste, or would buy the cocaine base, and ship it. They handled the marketing and the business. Uh, later on, they started to make their own cocaine. To make it big, Colombia's cocaine traffickers need to crack the U.S. market. Ever since the 1960s, drugs have been part of American counterculture, but cocaine still isn't seen as a serious threat. When we first started seeing cocaine come into New York uh, circa 1977, 78, uh, the attitude of the DEA was it was kitty dope compared to heroin. So there was not really a focus on uh, cocaine. Colombia may have the cocaine, but the traffickers can't get it into the U.S. in quantity. Carlos Leda plans to change all that. It's like an hourglass, and there's this one point right in the middle where you have to get the cocaine from one place and get it to the other. Figuring out how to do that is what Carlos Leda's claim to fame was. Leda tells Young that he can get hold of a steady supply of cocaine. If they use light aircraft in the same way Young did with marijuana, profits will go through the roof. Leda's good behavior in Danbury gets him paroled in 1976, but he is immediately deported to Colombia. Now 27, he is determined to get some payback for the humiliation of being kicked out of the USA. Leda soon begins to live up to his word. Paroled a year before Leda in 1975, Young is back dealing in marijuana when he gets a telegram. It says, come down, the weather is beautiful. It's the signal Leda is ready to put his plan into action. It all goes down on an island just two hours flight from Colombia. They took a few kilos, put them in uh, suitcases, and uh, shipped them off with a friend of his to Antigua, an island in the Caribbean. 
Meanwhile, George Young got his girlfriend and a friend of hers to fly down to Antigua with suitcases, swap the suitcases, and bring back the cocaine. It worked. As soon as the cocaine reaches the US, Young carries it on a flight to Los Angeles. The cocaine is handed to his old marijuana dealer in exchange for cash. Just one 50 kilo shipment gets them $2.2 million. They made a really good profit. They knew that they were on their way. The key to their sky-high profits is the quality of the cocaine Leda is getting from Colombia. They gave the distributors like 90, 95% pure uh, cocaine. So the distributors wanted as much as they could get. In one stroke, Leda has become the go-to guy for cocaine. His plan to get America hooked on the drug has begun. But his motive isn't just money. Because of his hatred for the United States, he looked at cocaine as the atomic bomb that he was going to drop on the United States, and that's exactly what he had in mind. Later's first cocaine operations are just raids to test America's defenses. Now he plans to launch an all-out assault. You will receive one more set of warning shots. I will then fire into your vessel. Do you understand? With a coastline 8,500 miles long, Florida is wide open to drug shipments arriving by sea from South America. We were up against it, no doubt about it. Florida is a huge state. You had any number of seaports they could use to uh, smuggle cocaine in on commercial ships. With the help of local law enforcement and the U.S. Coast Guard, many of the drug shipments are intercepted. But in 1978, undercover DEA agent Mike McManus starts to see more and more cocaine on the streets. Back then, we started buying in grams of cocaine. And then all of a sudden, we're buying ounces of cocaine. And then all of a sudden, kilograms are available. And you're seeing this emerging trend you know, beginning to build in South Florida. Miami is already being rocked by bloody shootouts between rival cocaine gangs competing for supplies of the drug. Cocaine wars hit South Florida, specifically Miami. And now you're hearing about the Colombians are in town. And there's turf wars. And there's Uzi machine guns that you need to be worried about. Assistant U.S. Attorney Eileen O'Connor is swamped by the increase in drug cases. All hell was breaking loose. We had cocaine cowboys in the streets, shootings, all sorts of things. The shipments coming in by sea don't explain the amount of cocaine pouring into Miami. There must be a loophole in the DEA's defenses. There was a DEA agent who was also a pilot. And he was of the belief that cocaine was being smuggled into the United States, not just on boats, but in airplanes. So he went to his bosses at DEA and got them to agree to set up a sting operation. The DEA pilot poses as a smuggler willing to fly in anything for a price. And sure enough, he was getting all these transportation people come in that were flying loads of cocaine into the United States. But the loads of cocaine are not coming from Colombia, 1,700 miles away. Instead, the DEA pilot is recruited to pick up a load of cocaine from the Bahamas. Now, the Bahamas at that time, 110 small boat harbors, over 700 islands, 100 airstrips, which is a smuggler's paradise. Following instructions, the DEA pilot lands on a remote four-mile-long island called Norman's Key, just 200 miles from Florida. Nothing unusual is visible from the air, but on the ground he finds huts full of cocaine-filled duffel bags, refueling points, and armed guards. 
and running the whole operation is Carlos Leda. Norman's key is his masterstroke. He got the bright idea that if he could transship cocaine from an intermediate place between Colombia and the United States, he could move much, much larger quantities. Using the money from his deals with Young, Leda has transformed the peaceful island. There was a short landing strip that could accommodate small aircraft, but he wanted it to be used to smuggle large loads of cocaine from Colombia, so he expanded it to 1,000 meters, which would accommodate you know, very large aircraft. Cocaine shipments arriving from Colombia are transferred to light aircraft, which take off for the short flight to Florida. Later makes sure they slip into US airspace unseen. Commercial flights were leaving, and they were piggybacking underneath these commercial flights and avoiding radar. He, he was himself a pilot. He hired the best pilots. Very intelligent in telling anybody how to build a, a, a flight plan that can be radar proof. Very intelligent in scrambling radio frequencies so nobody can listen to our conversation. The drug pilots head for secret landing sites. These uh, planes were landing on clandestine airstrips out in the Everglades. They would throw duffel bags of cocaine out to waiting counterparts who would then get the cocaine, jump in vehicles and drive off, and then the plane would just take off again. It was amazing how much cocaine was coming in by airplane, small planes. You know, you can fit a couple of hundred kilos on a small plane. A few hours after leaving Leda's Island, the cocaine is speeding to dealers in Miami and all over America. Once Norman's Key gets into business, this is when you see this huge surge in cocaine in the United States. Half of the cocaine arriving in Florida is coming through Norman's Key. The numbers are mind-boggling. I'm talking about thousands of kilograms of cocaine a month. Using Norman's Key as a backdoor air route into Florida from Colombia has another huge advantage for Leda. It puts him outside US jurisdiction. DEA agents operating in a foreign country have no arrest authority. They're there to work with local law enforcement. And they were up against some real obstacles dealing with the corruption factor. The DEA's agents in the Bahamas try to get the government to take action. But Leda has been greasing palms from the bottom right to the very top. While he was there on Norman's Cay, he had the protection of the Bahamian government. And he was told, you can stay there, you can use the island, but you're gonna have to pay us. And there were a lot of people making a lot of money in the Bahamas. All this time, George Young has been the link man between Leda and America's drug dealers. But now Leda calls Young to a meeting. Young became a, a huge user of cocaine. You use a lot of cocaine and it makes you paranoid. Young began to think that Later was going behind his back, uh, stealing his distributors in Los Angeles, and uh, generally trying to shove him out of the business. Young is right to be paranoid. Later really has bypassed him to deal direct with the distributors. Later tells the older man he is history. He cut George Jung out because he wanted all the money and he wanted the power. With distribution in the US under his control, Leda invites Colombia's top cocaine producers to visit his island. Later had the idea that it was going to be some sort of a nice, cozy resort where his friends in the cocaine business from Colombia could meet their distributors from the United States and everybody would have a great time and they'd ship, you know, tons of cocaine from uh, Norman's Key to the United States. 
One cocaine VIP who is crucial to the flow of drugs to the island will soon carve his own bloody path to the top of the DEA's most wanted list. His name is Pablo Escobar. By 1979, Carlos Leda has made it into the big leagues. If the DEA don't stop him, his dream of getting the nation hooked on cocaine will become America's nightmare. Right under the noses of the Florida DEA, Carlos Leda has turned the tiny Bahamas island of Norman's Key into a major cocaine supply base. It has all the luxuries money can buy. He had a three-car garage. He had, you know, beautiful cars there. Corvettes and other exotic cars that he would drive around the island. Fast cars aren't the only thrill on Leda's island. He also transformed it into a Sodom and Gomorrah. Some of his associates would fly in and he would have naked women picking them up at the airstrip. And he took all these beautiful little girls to his own parents and took them to the Bahamas and made them his mistresses. He would have orgies that were fueled by cocaine, liquor for weeks. Leda's schoolmate, Carlos Toro, is working as a CBS cameraman in New York when Leda invites him to the key. He sent me a Learjet to LaGuardia. His pilot picked me up and took me to the Bahamas, and it was like, wow, this is beautiful. The plane is, is uh, slowing down, uh, taxiing to a parking spot. And I see a Land Rover uh, with the top down coming towards me. And in that vehicle, uh, three gorgeous girls from, from my hometown that, you know, the girls that you always wanted but you're never going to get. And now they were there and, and they're half naked. And, and they welcomed me with open arms and, and come on home. And Carlos is there and we hug. And, and uh, it's nothing but uh, a fantasy private island in the Bahamas. Beautiful women, a lot of fun, uh, sun and uh, good food and uh, drink and marijuana and cocaine. Leda isn't just being generous. He needs his old friend to act as a front for his organization. He insisted, Carlos, you need to come work with me. I'll make you a millionaire overnight. He says, Carlos, let me tell you something. You will not be exposed to the cocaine. You're not going to go into the labs. You're not going to go. You're not going to load the airplanes. You're not going to unload the airplanes. You would be in a different category. I said, "What is that?" He says, "You're going to be our public relations director." Later makes it clear that his cocaine suppliers in Colombia approve of his choice of PR man. They think you're smart, you're intelligent, and maybe you would be able to help us in dealing with the heads of government and. Uh, you know, uh, to a more uh, diplomatic uh, role. And I like the sound of that. It was like, yeah, that's more like me. You know, I don't want to be a drug dealer. I wanted to be part of it. Toro becomes Leda's frontman and paymaster for the drug pilots flying to Norman's Key, handling more money than he has seen in his life. I'm talking about six, seven million dollars in cash in duffel bags that I would bring to my house, put in my attic, and from there I pay operations. By 1980, Norman's Key is really paying off. In that year alone, Leda flies 10,000 kilos of cocaine into the United States. They were bringing cocaine, 1,500 kilos every other week. It was a huge operation, and they were making millions of dollars every day. The victim was Horacio Martinez, who was shot to death in a parking garage near the Miami airport as he climbed from his wheelchair. While later parties, Miami reels under the onslaught of the cocaine he is shipping in. 
I mean, it was bad. It was really bad there for a while. Multiple murders in nice neighborhoods and shootouts in broad daylight on highways, in shopping centers, restaurants, and airports. It was a tidal wave. It was a tidal wave of cocaine that was coming in. Unable to act directly against Norman's key, the DEA tried to target Leda's pilots and the airstrips he is using to get cocaine into Florida. We'd lie in wait, and when the planes come in, we'd, uh, we'd, have, we'd respond. Sometimes we got lucky and made the arrests and seizures, but more too often, they got away with it because nobody knew about it. All these aircraft were seized when their pilots were caught smuggling. The DEA get lucky when some arrested pilots give up the details of Leda's operation. Now, they have enough evidence for an indictment. Leda is indicted for smuggling, conspiracy, and tax evasion. Now the US government plays hardball with the Bahamas. Leda goes, or else. He has been able to dodge uh, a lot of trouble with police and government authorities in the Bahamas by uh, paying bribes and by intimidation. The Bahamian government and the US government finally got together and said, you know, this is it. The big picnic that he'd had there for so many years was over. Frontman Toro gets a call from a Bahamian government contact who lays it on the line. And he says, Carlos has to go. I, I, I can no longer continue. Uh, getting pressure from the uh, United Nations, DEA, the US government, uh, Cuba. We can no longer allow these airplanes coming into the island uh, loaded with cocaine anymore. It's, it's a disaster. And on Norman's Key itself, things are getting out of control. But having uh, hundreds of kilos of cocaine around all the time, people started to sample the wares. And uh, later had about 50 employees, 50 guys, mostly bodyguards, thugs, um, uh, with him on uh, Norman's Key. And as they got further and further strung out on cocaine, uh, they weren't getting any sleep, they were getting paranoid, and they were sort of looking over their shoulder. And uh, it was uh, a really nasty scene. Later, scheme to use the key to flood the U.S. with cocaine seems to be coming apart. It looks like the DEA have a real chance to drag Leda back to face the music in the USA. But Leda is already planning to quit the Bahamas. He is invited to a meeting of Colombia's top drug producers. Carlos Leder was an honored guest there because he had been the one who had pioneered the transportation network to get cocaine from Colombia to the United States. Cocaine production in Colombia is taking place on a massive scale. To reach the very top, Leder needs to go back to his homeland and get in on the action. You need to scale up if you want to become big time. And later, in particular, definitely wanted to be big time. Before leaving Norman's Key, Leda has a last message for the DEA who tried to snare him in the Bahamas. He takes pamphlets that says, DEA, go home. And he has two of his pilots fly over Nassau. You know, they were having an Independence Day festival and they drop the leaflets with one dollar bills, thousands of them on top of the people there. Now to achieve his goal of using cocaine as the ultimate weapon against America, Leda plans to copy his idol Adolf Hitler and take over a whole country. He was going to create a new Colombia and he was going to be the ruler of that country. First, the 32-year-old Leda stages a big comeback in his hometown of Armenia. He claims he is a business tycoon who made his fortune in the USA. This is a shitty little place that nobody knew about. But Carlos Leda came into this town with millions of dollars and changed the culture and changed the fabric of our beliefs in our integrity. 
Norman's Key may have closed down, but later sets up new routes to get cocaine to his dealers. He was the one responsible for moving the loads of cocaine out of Colombia into places like Panama, Cuba, places of that nature in the Caribbean. And the money keeps rolling in. He became ultra wealthy. He had apartment complexes. He had beautiful cars. He dominated not only the social scene, but the political scene. And he did whatever he wanted. As part of his new image, Leda builds a huge country estate in the hills outside Armenia. At the estate, Leda sets up a Nazi-style party called the National Latin American Movement. And his idea was German-style control of running Latin America. He was going to be following the uh, philosophy of Adolf Hitler and build a new uh, Latin American reign. In my opinion, he lost it. He, uh, he was out of control. But his lavish spending and fancy lifestyle attracts attention from an unexpected quarter. A Colombian anti-government extremist group called the 19th of April Movement, or M19, tries to kidnap Leda for ransom. But Leda gives his kidnappers the slip and escapes. Now, he wants revenge. He calls together Escobar and the other top cocaine traffickers. They knew they had a problem with the terrorists. They wanted to protect themselves. In unity, there is strength. Leda, Escobar, and the others form a vigilante group. They call Muerte a Sequestradores, or Death to Kidnappers, MAS for short. Once again, Leda airdrops flyers. This time, they are not carrying cash, but a brutal threat. MAS will kill anyone trying to kidnap the cocaine barons. DEA agent Mike Kane is an eyewitness to the MAS terror campaign. I remember driving to work one day with my partner downtown Medellin, and there was a uh, number of police on the street, and the, uh, uh, the street was uh, cordoned off, and it had the crime tape all over the area. And as we drove by, we saw a, a body hanging in the tree, and the sign around it had death to kidnappers. M-19's leaders are murdered one by one until the terrorists give in. From now on, the drug traffickers are off limits. By setting up MAS, Leda has done more than destroy the kidnap threat. He has created a monster that will plague Colombia for years to come. The light bulb went on and they said to each other, why are we fighting with each other? Why are we competing with each other? Let's ban our talents and our resources, and we'll be much stronger and much more capable of shipping cocaine and selling cocaine, distributing cocaine in the United States and perhaps elsewhere, and we'll all make a lot more money doing that. So that is truly how the uh, Medellin cartel was born. Later is now seen by the other traffickers as one of their own, for his skill in getting cocaine to the US market and for defending them in Colombia. He proved himself to the cartel so well that Pablo Escobar knew that there could be people like him or better, but they, they couldn't trust it. Carlos had already been trusted and tested, and they wouldn't look anywhere else. Later's name joins Pablo Escobar at the top of the DEA's list of most wanted Colombian cocaine traffickers. He had the address book. He knew where to sell it. He knew how to market it. He knew who to sell it to. He knew who would, uh, who would buy it. And he knew how to collect. Later's network of dealers in the USA gives him final word on drug shipments. His Miami paymaster, Toro, 
even hears Escobar get the brush off. Pablo Escobar said, Carlos, you son of a bitch, I got 80,000 kilos sitting here. I had already been paid for them, and I have to deliver them all over the world. What are you going to do for me? And Carlos will say, well, you have to be patient. I can only move 2,000 at a time or 5,000 at a time. And there was nothing Pablo could do except wait. Ever since Leder got back to Colombia from the Bahamas, the DEA has been asking for his extradition. Now two federal prosecutors and a Florida DEA team come to Colombia to demand action. Extradition is the one thing Leder and the other cocaine barons fear. You could take their cocaine, they had more cocaine to send. Uh, you could take their, their money. Uh, they still had plenty of money uh, coming into their coffers, if you will. But once you're going to take their freedom, they knew the jig was up, and they weren't going to stand for that. Three, to the fury of the U.S. team, the Colombian government won't play ball. The Colombian government was dragging their feet, and uh, the uh, drug traffickers, led by Escobar and later, had actually mounted a campaign to make sure that there was no extradition treaty. Leder says his political party will fight extradition. He delivers an ultimatum to the government. And saying publicly, if you sign an extradition treaty, uh, the war is on, you know, we declare war in Colombia. But first, Leder declares war on the DEA in Colombia. He puts a $350,000 bounty on its agents, and his killers look for a chance to cash in. In terms of uh, the traffickers threatening DEA, absolutely. I had a uh, open contract by Carlos Ledeer on my head. In some ways, it's a badge of honor. Well, I must be doing something right. I could hear a motorcycle right behind my car. And I knew that they were after me, and I had a weapon ready. I figured that I, I would be able to kill both of them if they, if they attempted something. Vigil's pursuers back off when they realize they have been spotted. That was a very close call. Then in April 1984, Leda's fellow cartel member Pablo Escobar targets the Minister of Justice, Rodrigo Lara Bonilla, for supporting extradition. Lara Bonilla leaves his office. He's being tracked by a motorcycle. He's in his car. The motorcycle weaves to the right-hand side of the vehicle. They open up with an Ingram and shoot Lara Bonilla several times in the head. The shooter was 16 years old, and the driver of that motorcycle was 19 years old. That would be equivalent to very young teenagers assassinating the Attorney General of the United States. The murder of Lara Bonilla shocks Colombia and turns people against the drug lords. But it's a breakthrough for the DEA. The president of Colombia uh, was feeling a lot of pressure, and there was a lot of pressure on him. And uh, he decided that he was going to extradite traffickers. And Carlos Leder was his number one target. The president's extradition warrant shatters Leder's dreams of an empire. He takes refuge in Colombia's forest wilderness. For the DEA, the chase isn't over. It's just begun. He flees into the jungle. The Colombians raid a house, and they find about two to three million dollars in cash there. And then pictures of Adolf Hitler splattered across the walls of that residence. It's open season on Leda for the DEA. 
Working with the Colombian National Police, they target every likely hideout. Leading the task force is Mike Kane. As we were doing this, we were getting closer and we were bringing pressure on Lee Dare, pressure that uh, he didn't like, pressure that made it much more difficult for him to do his job. Stripped of his power and luxuries, Leda begins to fall apart. The man who set out to destroy the US by getting the nation hooked on cocaine now becomes an addict himself. Carlos Leder was sort of a megalomaniac, and uh, the cocaine just jacked him up to the skies. And so uh, he started to pretty much lose control of himself, too. In a TV interview at his jungle hideout, he says point blank that he is going to use cocaine to destroy the USA. The massive hunt for Leda starts to bring heat down on the rest of the Medellin cartel, including Pablo Escobar. We did start to rattle some cages, if you will, uh, and uh, the reaction on the part of Carlos Lider and uh, his colleagues was uh, to strike back and to, uh, you know, to, uh, start threatening us. Escobar puts the word out. It's open season on the DEA. The DEA agents began using bulletproof vehicles. They started issuing us uh, M16 military rifles to protect ourselves. When the DEA keep coming, Escobar threatens to make war on their families. His response was, let's kidnap the children, and if these gringos are going to uh, extradite any more of us, we're going to kill their children. Wives and families are sent back to the USA and the hunt for Leda steps up a gear. Three years after Leda went on the run, the Colombian police get a tip off. He is hiding out in a country house near Medellin. In a dawn raid, the police swoop on the building. But as they move in, they are spotted by Leda's guards. A vicious firefight breaks out. But for all his tough talk, Leda wants no part of it. He started to run out of the house, ran right into a cop put a pistol right between his eyes and said, get down on the floor. The quick thinking later isn't finished yet. He tried to bribe the cop who arrested him, but uh, didn't work. Later and his bodyguards are photographed by the police and he tries to treat his arrest as a joke. But the joke is on him. Leda has been sold down the river by the one cartel partner he thought had his back. His old friend, Escobar. Pablo Escobar is actually the one that turned him in because he saw him as somebody that could bring down the, the uh, cartel and he just wanted him out of the area. Leda is taken to Bogota airport where a DEA plane is waiting. In just a few hours, he is in a US prison. Now back from Colombia, veteran agent Mike Vigil goes to interrogate the DEA's most important prisoner. Later tries to buy his freedom and get some payback for Escobar's treachery. He mentioned to me that he was willing to do Pablo Escobar but I would have to send him back to Colombia so that he could work with the Colombian military. And I said, sure, I'm gonna do that, Carlos. I'm gonna send you back to Colombia. I said, you're not, never gonna step out of the, these uh, four walls here. Later is put on trial in Jacksonville, Florida. 
later was slipped in and out of Jacksonville's federal courthouse amid what some say is the tightest security this city has ever seen. Police and federal agents feared efforts to spring later, attempts to kill him, or acts of retribution for his arrest. It was a heavily protected site. Sharp shooters on the roof, you name it. One of those due to testify is the former front man for Leda's Norman's Key operation, Carlos Toro. He broke with the cartel three years earlier to become a top undercover informant for the DEA. The cartel hasn't forgotten Toro. The prosecutor is taking no chances and Toro is escorted at all times by US Marshals. Two o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, Marshals came into my room, they wake me up, they craft me, and, and, and they put a blanket on my head and I'm taken into the elevator of the hotel, into the trunk of a car. And I'm driven out of Jacksonville, Florida. And they explained, we uh, discovered two Colombians hired by Pablo Escobar. They were paid $250,000 as just a retainer to make sure you die if you take the stand tomorrow. The DEA feel Toro is too valuable to risk. Another star witness takes his place. The man later cheated out of millions when he set up his organization years before. George Young. Now he's out for revenge. George did a very good job when he testified. His testimony was corroborated by a lot of the evidence. But it's always great when you have the witness that can put the icing on the cake or put the bow on the package and explain everything. It's invaluable. Victory for the good guys tonight in what was called the most important drug case in US history. In a trial lasting seven months, Leda is found guilty of smuggling, conspiracy, and tax evasion. He is sentenced to life without parole, plus 135 years. What was important was that he got extradited he was tried, he was convicted, and he was sent to federal prison for the rest of his natural life. This victory uh, is uh, both a real victory and a symbolic victory uh, to the American people uh, and to the people of Colombia uh, who expect that drug traffickers, no matter who they are, how powerful they are, how violent they are, uh, should be subject to the rule of law and not above the law.